arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him for he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, and surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. When Christ's appearing was made known, King Herod trembled for his throne. But he who offers heavenly birth Seeks not the kingdoms of this earth The eastern sages saw from far And followed on his guiding star by light their way to light they trod And by their gifts confess their God Within the Jordan's sacred flood The heavenly Lamb in meekness stood that he of whom no sin was known Might cleanse his people from their own And oh, what miracle divine 
when water reddened into wine, he spoke the word and forth it flowed in streams that nature never bestowed. For this is glad he After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. What star is this, with beams so bright, more beauteous than the noonday light? It shines to herald for a king and Gentiles to his crib to bring. So wrote Charles Coffin in 1973. In the Western Church, January the 6th, the day just passed, is always the beginning of Epiphany Tide, the time when we move from celebrating Christ coming into the world to recognizing the significance of his appearing. It is particularly significant for us because the first event of Christ's post-infant life is his appearing to the Gentiles. The arrival of the Magi bearing three gifts for the young Jesus, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The second week of Epiphany, we will remember Christ's baptism, and the third week we will note the wedding at Cana. We have contemplated the reality that God became flesh and dwelt among us, recalling God's first post-creation act coming down and walking in the garden with his image bearers and foreshadowing his ultimate purpose trumpeted so clearly in Revelation, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, Hine, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God, which we recall in every grace after meals. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy, and true. Revelation chapter 20, verses 3 through 21, 3 through 5. Now we 
manifest Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior of the world and the King of all creation. Only an infant king would receive tribute from afar, gifts costly beyond measure, brought without duress, offered willingly by men great in their own right, learned beyond their peers. Tradition names them for us as Gaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. We honor them for listening to the Spirit's signs and whispers. The word epiphany is used three times in the New Testament. On two occasions, it refers to the second coming. Paul writes in Titus 2.13 that we are awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing or the epiphanion of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You might look also at 2 Thessalonians 2.8. The third use of the word, however, refers to Christ's first coming, which we recognize in Epiphany. 2 Timothy 1 Verses 9 and 10 say, The grace which God now has manifested through the appearing, the epiphanias of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The question is, what value do these stories hold for us? We must penetrate beyond their simple recounting and find our place in them actively participate in them that we might play our part in the revealing, the manifestation of Christ's character to the world. Just as shepherds waited and magi wandered, so creation groans as it suffers the weight of a word world ruled, not by its creator, but by a counterfeit Lord. Who will not hesitate to bind any who allow him in the chains of frustration, failure, and the impossibility of fulfillment? Robert Weber has written, Even as the Incarnation finds its continuation in us through our union with Christ, so the Epiphany of Christ is extended in us through the practice of Epiphany spirituality. Our Epiphany journey can start at no better place than the Epiphany service of worship. The words of the Book of Common Prayer capture our attention. O God, who by the leading of a star didst manifest thy only begotten Son to the peoples of the earth, lead us, who know thee now by faith, to thy presence, where we may behold thy glory face to face, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The text, the scripture texts that belong to Epiphany, point to a prophecy fulfilled, a promised appearing once seen as a threatening presence on a mountain is now extended beyond the largely ethnic group that beheld that smoke, felt that trembling ground, and heard the blowing thunder to all who will respond. And the greatest power in the world has encased itself in the frame of a man, first an infant, then a young child, but though an adult, still a gentle Savior. The scripture taken as a whole appear like an hourglass set on its side. The left side of the hourglass contains the prophecies of Isaiah and the psalmist who proclaim the coming epiphany. The reading from Matthew stands at the center in the funnel of the hourglass, representing the arrival of the promise. And the right side of the hourglass represents the text from Ephesians, which describes the work of the church as the calling to manifest the Christ to the world. The glory of God has come to earth and will spread throughout the universe. This is the shout of epiphany the cry that is to grasp our hearts and give us hope because we have gazed into the face of God's glory. Isaiah writes, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness 
shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. The Old Testament text proclaimed the prophecy. The gospel relates the story of the beginnings of fulfillment, and the epistle declares the method of God's purpose continued. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known, might be revealed, might be made manifest, might be revealed. <clears throat> the church will manifest Christ's presence, his power, his character, his love, his message, his eventual triumph, first to the Jews and then to the nations of the world. The church is the sign of Christ in the world, the continuing manifestation of Jesus in the world. The church is not primarily a building, diocese, or denomination, but a people. I am the church. You are the church. I bid you now come, as did the Magi. Do not delay. Kneel at the feet of an infant child, now grown, though not yet gloriously enthroned as he will be. Acknowledge him as your rightful Lord and accept your calling to extend his vision to your neighbor, your son, your daughter, your friend, your co-worker, your loved one. May Christ be revealed not just to you, but in you and through you to the world. Amen.